My journey is probably a little different than a lot of people's. I was not saved until I was 38. I was in the world for a long time. I was raised Roman Catholic, uh, and I probably was a very bad Catholic at that <laughs> point. Christmas and Easter were basically the holidays I went to church until I was about, uh, I don't know, probably senior in high school. And at that point, I just completely fell away. Afterwards, I would say it was probably not until much later that I even thought about Christ in any real manner. I was an attorney for 20 years, uh, very happy being in the secular world. Money was king, and everything was supposed to be like the Kennedys. I was supposed to have a great family and <laughs> do all kinds of wonderful things for my community because that's what you do. And I didn't know anything about Jesus Christ, really. 16 years ago, a friend of mine invited me to a place called Eastern Hills Wesleyan Church. Changed my life forever met people there who were genuine, just genuine believers who were in love with God. And I had never seen anything like that in my life. I met people who were willing to take me under their wing and teach me. My children, uh, for the most part, are strong believers. My daughter is a pastor down in Carolina. I'm sorry, I'm getting a little emotional about that. <laughs> I like to read. I read a lot of stuff. I read a lot of leadership books. I read an awful lot of stuff by the dead guys, I call them, because I think the dead guys had a great deal of wisdom. Uh, Thomas Akempis. Um, one of my favorite writers is Henry Nouwen, and there was a book called In the Name of Jesus, and I read that book, and that changed the way I thought about things. Um, just every time I've, I've read books, they've affected me. I once read a book called The Tale of Three Kings mm -hmm. by Gene Getz. And I remember in the book he said, David didn't declare himself leader. He just went places and people followed him. <laughs> and that's because his men loved him. And he loved them and cared for them. My whole life has been an open book to my congregation, to the brothers and sisters at Eastern Hills. They've helped me in tough times. They've been there for me, they, I've been there for them, and we've shared life together. The Bible is everything to me. It's how I was saved. My wife kept giving me the Bible and said, read this book, you're reading all the wrong books. And I read the Bible, and I read it again, and I read it again, and I studied it. And they know, everybody watches me study it, and they know I study it, and they ask me about the Word. And I think that's helped a little bit. I mean, they see me as very involved with the words, so they trust me in that way, so they come to me with biblical questions and, and we work it through together, and everything else flows from, from that. And I think that's where my leadership has come from. In positions that we are in the church, sometimes we have a lot of friends and we want to keep friends, and there's, there's always a pressure to be a people pleaser mm -hmm. in the ministry. That's right. And the courage to speak truth in the midst of all that, biblical truth, but also just practical truth to some people, takes a little bit of courage. It takes a little bit of genuineness. I just finished a book by a guy named Eric Metaxas. Yeah. And Eric wrote a book called Seven Men. And these men are well known to everybody, Washington, Eric Little, Wilberforce, uh, he talks about uh, Dietrich Bonhoeffer. He talks about Jackie Robinson. I guess there's a movie coming out soon about Jackie Robinson. And he talks about Chuck Colson. And he said, these men had the courage to lead in their respective areas, and it cost them something. It cost them something. They actually had to, to pay in some way, maybe part of their lives, but also part of their family, we, they're very protective of our family. I know personally, there's always that balance between family and, and, and our positions. But I like the book and the men all, in each situation had a different set of things to deal with in their courage. Starting with Washington, who he talks about how Washington gave up the presidency and that was more courageous than being the great general. But for him to be able to walk away from something because he knew it was better for the people was the most amazing piece of courage that he's ever seen. And he puts that as, as number one in his book. I just thought that was a good example, mm -hmm. to be able to give to your people. I just got back from Rwanda. 
I spent uh, a week over there. And in that country, as you recall, there was the 1994 mm-hmm. genocide. And we were talking with a bishop over there and trying to ask how a country that's 94% Christian can go through a genocide. Mm-hmm. And he was very specific, and his first two answers were that the spiritual teachings had just gotten to a point where people were just kind of coasting, and every Western nation is in danger of that. And so holiness becomes so significant mm-hmm. to prevent something that happened, like what happened over there. And secondly, getting to authentic leadership, he said there was not authentic leadership in the Christian community in Rwanda, but it's self-centered leadership. Mm-hmm. And whenever you have a sense of self-centeredness that the Christianity is doing something for me as a leader, you're going to have people who see that right away. We just had St. Patrick's Day, right? Quote, unquote, the 17th. Patrick wrote a prayer called the Lorica. Mm -hmm. And in it, he asks that every person who sees him think of Christ just by seeing him. That every person that hears him think of Christ just by him speaking to them. Those are the things to me, when I look back to the voices of 2,000 years of Christianity, Mm -hmm. there are great men who have showed us a way and said, you have to look more like Christ, and then they'll believe, and then they'll be thinking of you as authentic. I think that's the way to do it.